Well, good morning, everybody. Let me invite you to come on in and grab a seat. Great to have you with us this morning. It's beautiful January Lord's Day. Welcome to Plasterita Bible Church. And if you're a visitor this morning, we want to give you a special welcome. We do that by just saying we're glad you're here and make sure you stop by our welcome table out front under our covered patio. We have some more information about our church we'd love to give to you. And we just want to say thanks again for being with us today. We hope that you're encouraged and blessed in your time together. So our first announcement is we have a Plasterita Bible Church Men's Conference. It's coming up this next weekend. And I want to give this announcement in this way. If you're a man this morning, would you stand up with me? Come on. If you're a man in here this morning, would you stand up? Look at these men. All right, hey, if you're a college student, that counts at you. Come on. Yeah, we're clapping for you. If you're a young man, let's say ages 12 and 13, seventh grade and up, why don't you stand with me as well? No, no, stay standing. Please stay standing. All right, good. Men, I am inviting you to come to this men's conference. It's going to be an incredible time to listen to the preaching of God's word, to have fellowship with God's people. So if you're already registered for the conference, I want to ask you to sit down. If you've already registered for the conference, you can sit down. All right, I see if you sitting down. Oh my goodness, look what we have here. We have identified many men that I know you want to come and uh, we're inviting you to come. I want to just stress the importance of, uh, you know, it's not like we have a, tons of, a ton of men events. We have a men's breakfast we do a few times a year. We have this men's conference. I teach a mighty men class on Wednesday night. This is imperative that for you and your own sanctification, your own growth in the Lord, we really want to make sure you understand the value of being here this weekend. So if you're able to, if you're not at work and if you're not sick, uh, we really want you to make an effort to come. And you could do that by registering today. You can do that online or out on the patio. Uh, just know we love you and we're really asking you to pray and consider coming. You guys may, may all be seated at this point. We're going to give you a hand clap as you sit down. Hey, we love you guys. All right. All happening this weekend. Again, all the information on the website at the table out front. Hopefully, you'll be able to come and join us Friday night at 6 o'clock. We're going to have dinner together. And then we've got Scott Artivanis, our speaker. He's going to be with us Friday night and Saturday. It's going to be a phenomenal time together. Hopefully, we'll see you there. Also, for our college and young adults, we have a retreat for you. James mentioned it last week when he was up here making announcements. But on April the 1st through the 3rd, we're going camping out in Ojai. It's a little bit closer to the beach, but also kind of in the mountains. And so it's a great time for our college ministry to come out. We'll have some teaching as well on uh, how to know uh, and do God's will. And so we just wanted to let you know because there's an early bird registration, I think 15 bucks right now if you register. But if you wait till after February 10th, that goes up to 35 bucks. It just kind of helps us reserve the space that we need for camping. And so if you have any questions about that, you can see James Street, our college director. We'd love to have you college students hanging out with us on that particular weekend. And then I wanted to let you guys know about Joshua Clutter him, who went to be with the Lord this week. Many of you have been tracking with his uh, testimony, his life, his ministry. He was diagnosed with a terminal illness a little bit over a year ago. His lovely wife, Meredith, and Josh together had five boys. Uh, Josh served faithfully here in our church for several years, helping oversee our counseling ministry. He was also a a, um, a, a worker over at the Masters University in the MABC department. For the last five years, he's been in St. Louis, Missouri, teaching at a small Bible college, and uh, he passed away this past week. He's been fighting hard. We've been praying for him, reaching out to him. Many members of our church know him well. If you would like to give to a special fund to help support Meredith and those five kids, you could do that uh, by just going to the Push Pay app that most of you use for giving, or you can call the church office if you need help with that. And it just there's a fund, a, a pinwheel that just says clutter and whatever gift you want to make this week and next week, we're going to have that available for you. Our church has already made a donation uh, towards the family, but if you just wanted to help out as an individual, we wanted to let you know about, uh, about his passing and about an opportunity that you might have to help. And of course, we might pray, obviously, for Meredith and for the family this morning. So that's a Joshua Clutterham update. He's in heaven, much better place, but boy, it sure is tough, as you might imagine, for Meredith and for those five boys. So let's be thinking about them. And if you want to make a gift, if we've made that available. Well, this Sunday is Sanctity of Life Sunday. It's an opportunity for us to realize that we're almost at 50 years since Roe versus Wade passed in 1973. And uh, so I think that we want to uh, remember what's going on by watching this video and then praying for our pregnancy center and seeing how we can continue the fight for life from God's word and together as citizens of our community.
created for purpose, a unique genetic blueprint from the moment of conception. DNA woven together to determine gender, eye color, hair color, fearfully and wonderfully made, valued beyond measure. Our culture says life is disposable, her rights matter most, it's not really a baby, and it's all one big choice. But God created us in his own image and whispered, I have called you by name, you are mine. In the United States, abortion is legal throughout the entire pregnancy, totally unrestricted. Most recently, abortion has been boxed up in the form of two little pills and a promise to make it all go away. What will you do to make a difference for life? How can you be a voice? Will you help save a life? There are over 2,700 pregnancy centers in the United States, serving men and women free of charge and full of hope, providing pregnancy tests, life-affirming counsel, abortion recovery, classes, clothing, and diapers. Many centers offer the first glimpse of a woman's baby in the womb displaying the magnificence of creation and the precious beats of a tiny heart, perfectly formed and fashioned by the one who created them. They serve faithfully, love well, encourage, they are hope dealers. They need volunteers, your prayers, and your financial support. Will you please give generously and help make a difference for life today? Come on, let's do it. We're gonna, there we go. <laughs> you know what? We're privileged to be a part of our pregnancy center right here in Santa Clarita. We support them financially every month. We participate in the Walk, of, uh, walk for Life. Uh, one of our members has been serving there as a medical director for a number of years. And so if you're interested in helping out, you can just pray. Obviously, you could just go on their website. We do a, a specific fundraiser, I believe, between Mother's Day and Father's Day. Uh, so there's things happening all through the year. But this Sunday is an opportunity for us to remember uh, what they're doing, to pray wh how maybe you could play a part. And if you have some interest in that, you could come talk to me or some others on our staff here, and we'll try to point you in the right direction. So if you have a Bible with you this morning, let me invite you to open up to Psalm 140. Uh, to 142, and let me invite you to stand with me as well in honor of God's word. And this psalm, uh, the title of my Bible says, You are my refuge. A mascal of David when he was in the cave, a prayer. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. Amen. You may be seated. Father, we thank you for this morning, the opportunity to pray and to consider what we've learned here, even in Psalm 142, as David was facing imminent danger and difficulty with the, the surroundings around him being filled with hate and despair, and yet in his inner man, in his soul, he's crying out to you. And he's acknowledging this morning that you are our refuge, that you're our portion in the land of the living, and that we desire, God, that we would always put our, our faith in you and our trust in you. You are our security. You are our tower. We run to you to find our safety. This morning, we know that the righteous surrounds us, that you will deal bountifully with us as we look to you and to your word. And so we're praying, God, that you would be exalted in our hearts this morning as we consider these truths. 
God, we want to pray for the world that we live in today. We lift up our missionaries that faithfully support you around the globe. And we want to pray for Kim Guess, who's been serving in India, excuse me, in Romania for many years. We just pray, God, that you would bless her today as she's had a couple of different trials with some friends who faced difficulty. And um, I just pray, God, that you would encourage her to be a blessing to those friends and that you would allow her and her work there in Romania as they help out with an orphanage and in their local church, that you would build her up today and you would encourage her and that she would continue to be a, a shining face of the mercy and the grace of God. Lord, we pray for our country today. As we consider uh, the Sanctity of Life Sunday, we know what this means for our own nation as we have a few Supreme Court cases that will be uh, coming to a full head uh, this year and, and some decisions will be made in June uh, by the Supreme Court from what I'm told, God. So we just pray right now, God, that you would be at work in uh, the, the justices that sit on the Supreme Court, God, that they would make decisions that wouldn't try to honor society in the sense of popularity, but they would make decisions that would honor your word and that would honor the heart behind our Constitution, and that we pray that as citizens of America, God, that we would stand and fight for life. And so we're praying, God, that you would allow us to be a part of that fight, both politically and just biblically, by holding firm to your word and helping be a part of our local pregnancy center, giving, serving, and uh, offering to help and, and to volunteer there as needed. And so, God, we just thank you so much for what you're doing at our pregnancy center and how our church is already involved. And I pray that you would stir us up to continue that fight. God, this morning we want to pray for uh, Meredith Clutterham as we talked about the passing of Joshua earlier this week. And we just pray, God, that you would comfort her, that you would be with her. And for those five boys, God, that you would allow them to see your goodness and that they would receive your mercy and that as they grow up, that they would have a soft heart towards God and that they would realize that their dad was a godly man who preached your word and who taught uh, how to counsel from the Bible accurately and that they would be encouraged by his legacy and that we could just be a part of that by giving and praying for them today, that you would bless the Clutterham family as they move forward, be with not only the immediate family, but with any extended family, friends, the school where he taught, the church where he's been serving. God, I pray that you would just wrap your arms around all of them and that you would show them your love and your encouragement today. Thank you for the hope that we have of Christ and that for Joshua, he's in a better place in your presence, even at this moment rejoicing for all eternity with no more pain. And so we're thankful for that, for him, God. Pray for our community right here in Santa Clarita. We want to lift up Santa Clarita Baptist Church. We thank you for Pastor David Caldwell, who you brought to be the pastor there just a little over a year ago. Pray that he would continue to be faithful to preach the word and you'd bless that body of believers to hold tight to Jesus and to be a light for you. God, thank you for Placerita. We're just so grateful to be a part of this church, and we pray that you would be with us today as we come to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we pray for our, our men's conference. God, just, just, just help us to have there who you want to be there, Lord. We know it's not about huge numbers, but it's just about individual lives being touched and changed with good teaching and good fellowship and good uh, time to serve one another, and so I pray we'd have a great time together this coming weekend, and as we continue our time of worship now, God, I pray that you would be exalted in the praises of your people. So thankful for our folks here on stage that lead us in worship week in and week out. And so I pray that now as we sing, we would sing to our risen Christ, our first love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Indeed, we have the opportunity to uh, praise our King today. Our Lord is sovereign. He sits on the throne. Let's stand together and we'll lift our voices and praise our Lord this morning. Chariots of wrath, the deep dark. 
what tongue can recite. You breathe in the air. You shine.
be seated. Us may come forward. Let's pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another glorious morning that we can share together and sing together and worship you together. Father, there's so many things that are occurring in this world that uh, are out of our control. We thank you that you're in control. And we don't need to know what tomorrow holds, Lord, because we know you hold tomorrow. I pray that this offering would be, Father, one that helps us to sacrifice. Sacrifice things that we enjoy, the things that we take for granted every day, Lord, and that we can give to the work of the ministry in this church, to the counseling that occurs for the folks that need it, Lord. I pray for also the counseling center for the um, abortion the situation that's going on. I pray that you would help us to give to the pregnancy center, Father, as well. And Lord, through all of this, I pray that you would be lifted up and glorified for your kingdom to advance, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And while the men collect the offering, we'll stay seated, but I encourage you, let's continue to sing um, together this morning.
This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Thank you so much for leading us this morning. Love singing those songs with the congregation and with those serving us here on stage. If you have a Bible with you, why don't you open up to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 8, doing a verse-by-verse study through this incredible story of early church history here, all inspired by God and just telling us what's happening in the life of the apostles and their close associates as the gospel continues to spread. And so the title of the sermon this morning is One Encounter Can Change Your Life. One Encounter Can Change Your Life. We're in Acts chapter 8, and we'll pick up in verse 25 and read down to the end of the chapter. The author, Luke, writes this. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Father, we're grateful this morning to read this account of Acts chapter 8 about Philip continuing his evangelistic work. And I pray that as we dive into the text this morning, that you would help us to make some observations and to be encouraged and to be challenged, to be more faithful in our own witness for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, everybody enjoys a good story about before and after, right? The most common stories about before and after might be some of those weight loss testimonials that you see sometimes uh, in the media. And uh, don't you love hearing about that person who maybe lost 100 pounds after a lot of hard work? I mean, that's just simply amazing. The heaviest person ever recorded was John Minnick, and he weighed a whopping 1,400 pounds, Before he died at age 41, he lost 925 of those pounds. Now, that's incredible. Can you imagine seeing the before and after pictures like that? Unbelievable. Or how about the pictures about those men who are using Rogaine? You know, you have those men who look sad, their their hair is thinning out, 
They've lost all their confidence, and then finally they start using some Rogaine and putting it on their scalp, and then you see the after picture. They got a full head of hair, and they got their confidence back because now they look better, right? I mean, we see this kind of stuff all the time. Lately, we've been seeing a lot of those cosmetic dental commercials uh, with those big smiles, right? You see a person that has awfully crooked and yellow teeth, and all of a sudden they get some type of procedure or Invisalign or braces, whatever, at the dentist, and it straightens out and whitens all their teeth, and now they have the gorgeous smile of a movie star. And you see the before and after pictures, and you're like, oh, man, that's just so different. Well, the book of Acts loves to tell its own before and after stories, only they are stories of conversion. Acts loves to highlight the changes that happen in a person when they come to Christ. After Jesus was arrested and held in custody, Peter denied Jesus three times. But in the book of Acts, starting in chapter 2, he's this bold preacher. And throughout the book of Acts, he's a fearless witness and a strong leader. The before and after of Peter couldn't be more startling. And what we're looking at Today is going to be the first of three major conversions in Acts. Here in Acts 8, we'll see the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 9, we'll see how Saul became Paul. And then in Acts chapter 10, you have Cornelius, of course, the Roman centurion. And believe it or not, this conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch that we're looking at this morning is in some ways the most amazing of those three. I mean, Saul is a terrorist who had ravaged the early church, and it's an incredible story to see how he comes to Christ. And, and the story of the conversion of Cornelius, the Roman centurion from Caesarea, in its own right is a phenomenal change. But as far as we can tell, this Ethiopian eunuch is the first convert from the great continent of Africa. And as we trace the expansion of the gospel during this early transition of the period of Acts chapter 8 through 10 that we'll be in here today and for the next several weeks, we see how the Holy Spirit is really reaching out to the whole world. Here in Acts 8, the Ethiopian who was converted was a descendant of Ham, Genesis 10 verse 6, where Cush refers to Ethiopia. In Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus will be saved, and he was a Jew and therefore a defendant of Shem, Genesis 10, 21. And in Acts 10, the Gentiles find Christ, and they are descendants of Japheth, Genesis 10, 2 through 5. If you'll remember, after the worldwide flood, in Genesis 10, 1, it says, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. And so here we see some of the Jewish converts who were the sons of Shem, and then we see some Gentile converts who were the sons of Japheth, but this is the first time that we're seeing some African converts who were the sons of Ham. And this is why Acts 1.8 is becoming so real and fulfilled throughout the book of Acts, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so the Ethiopian is representing for the first time somebody going beyond the normal area of the Middle East to the ends of the earth. This would be the, the least likely person that you would ever think would somehow come to Christ. He doesn't have a Jewish background like Paul. He, the Bible doesn't say that he was a God-fearing man like Cornelius. The Ethiopian was from Africa. I mean, he served in a court of the worst kind of idolatry, paganism, and deviant practices. He was from a, a whole new world that was over a thousand miles away. And yet he had come to Jerusalem. The Lord drew him to himself, and he was evangelized by Philip. And I love how Philip approaches the Ethiopian eunuch while he's riding upon his chariot. Some may say that we shouldn't bother others about having conversations about the gospel, but Philip was not only a faithful preacher, he was an obedient personal witness as well. And like the Lord Jesus, he was willing to leave the crowds at times and to approach the one lost soul and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with an individual in order to lead them to salvation. It was the great uh, evangelist, D.L. Moody, who once asked a man about his soul, and the man replied, it's none of your business. Oh, yes, it is my business, D.L. Moody said. And the man exclaimed, oh, then, you must be the evangelist Moody. 
In other words, he realized he was in trouble because he had met the evangelist face to face who had quite the reputation of being even on the streets in Chicago to personally evangelize individuals. You see, every Christian's business is to share the gospel with others and to do it without fear and without apology. And Philip's experience ought to encourage us in our own personal evangelism for the Lord. God directed Philip to the right person at the right time, and you and I must also always be ready to share Christ with others. And so this morning, as we look at the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, we'll see a divine encounter, verses 25 to 28, a clear declaration, verses 29 to 35, and then a genuine conversion, verses 36 through 40. Let's start with number one. If you're taking notes this morning, you see that main heading, number one, a divine encounter, and your first blank would be this, the the Spirit's preparation. The Spirit's preparation. Let's look at verse 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Well, this was after last week. We looked at that fiasco of Simon the sorcerer, and we're now seeing a convincing convert today with the Ethiopian eunuch. And so after Peter and John, if you remember, did come to Samaria to affirm both the gospel and to lay hands on the new believers, and they received the Holy Spirit after they did that work, showing and incredible unity of the early church to have some type of leadership and some type of spiritual guidance, we see now that Peter and John are returning to Jerusalem. And on their way back to the holy city, they continue to blaze a trail of preaching the gospel in many of the Samaritan villages. They had seen God's saving work in Samaria. At this point, centuries of debate, dissension, and division were now over. The completed Jews were now accepting the completed Samaritans. I'm just saying they're completed because they're now in Christ. The Samaritans who had mixed and intermarried with other pagan nations were now made pure through the gospel. And because of Christ, everything they had ever done had been forgiven. It had been forgiven and forgotten if they had truly repented and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus does. Jesus wipes away all sin. Jesus saves souls. Jesus mends relationships. He makes all things new. Jesus solidifies and he strengthens and he sanctifies his church. And then we see here in verse 26 where we read, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. An angel of the Lord is now involved in bringing an important message from God. Angels participate in God's plans. They're messengers, and they often give instructions, and they give directions, but they don't evangelize. That's our job. As human beings, we are created in the image of God. The elect have been saved by grace alone in order to glorify God by how we live and how we walk with Jesus. And a big part of the Christian's life is to be a minister, a servant, an ambassador for Christ. That's the calling on all of us as Christians. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says so much, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ. God making his appeal through us We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Angels can't testify of the gospel in the same way that people can because they've never experienced conversion. People, on the other hand, have the opportunity and the experience to declare the gospel in a very real way. They know what it's like to be born again. People know what it's like to be dead in their trespasses and sins, and they know what it's like to have new life in Christ. Christians know what it's like to suffer under the weight of their sin, and they know what it's like to be set free by the blood of Jesus who died in our place so that we could have forgiveness. And Peter talks about how the Old Testament saints were pointing all along towards the gospel. In 1 Peter 1.12, he says, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, Things which angels long to look. 
And so Peter's just talking there all along as the prophets were talking about the Christ to come. Angels were looking upon and watching in and sometimes participating, trying to better maybe understand and be in wonder and amazement, celebrating the gospel conversion of the life of individuals. And so this angel here is now playing a part, though he's not doing the evangelizing, he's playing a part by directing Philip to the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Gaza was in the ancient Philistine area. Today we know it as the Gaza Strip, basically the same general area to the south and a little bit west of Israel. There was those five ancient cities of the Philistines, Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, and Gath. And while in the Old Testament, Gaza had been destroyed earlier, there was a newer version of Gaza that had been built close to the Mediterranean coast. And this would have been the road that would have been often traveled and taken from those going from the Middle East down to Egypt and then to the rest of Africa. And Luke includes an extra detail in mentioning it there at the end of verse 26 where it says this was a desert place. Now again, at first glance, it may seem like a poor strategy to send Philip from a full-fledged revival happening in Samaria where all kinds of people are getting saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and all of a sudden the angel wants to take this man, the catalyst of this revival, and ship him off to Siberia. Well, to Gaza, all right? But he's kind of in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a desert, and yet we know the Holy Spirit is up to something good, right? He's preparing a divine encounter with the Ethiopian. Now that we've seen the Spirit's preparation, let's look at your next blank, the obedience of Philip. The obedience of Philip, verse 27, just those first few words says, and he rose and went. Love that about the scripture. When the Bible gives a clear directive to Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac, it says early the next morning, he got up and prepared his donkey, right? Philip gets the directions from the angel and he just rose and he went. I love that kind of obedience. Philip didn't argue he didn't debate, he didn't delay, he gave no pushback, no concern, no questions, he just rose and went. I think that we all as Christians need to learn to obey in that way again. If you've been struggling about just doing it, then just realize when the Bible calls us to do something, we need to obey right away. And Philip, again, he was in a populated place in Samaria, and now he's going to go to an isolated place. Philip is seeing great results to his ministry, and yet he's been called to go somewhere else. Philip was a humble and an obedient servant of Christ. Sometimes God takes us to places that you might not choose, but he's preparing you, and he's preparing a work for you to do that you would walk in it. And God may not speak to us today by the voice of an angel, but he has spoken to us through his word. And the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 4 verse 2 that we, and this would apply to all of us, are to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, to reprove and to rebuke and exhort and to complete, uh, with complete patience and teaching. And so we know we always got to be ready. Romans 1.16 says that we need to be unashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation for all who believe to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We understand that the great commission that Jesus gave us was for all of us to obey all of the time. Matthew 28.19, go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I certainly fall short all of the time in sharing Christ with others. But there are times where you just say, you know what, I just gotta do it. I just gotta, I gotta share with this guy. I remember when I was in PA school, training to be a physician's assistant. I was living in Augusta, Georgia, and one Saturday I was eating at Wendy's because you could order off the dollar menu. And so I'm hanging out at Wendy's and I got my Bible open and I'm reading and I noticed this homeless looking guy sitting over in the corner of Wendy's, looks like he had been there for a while. And I just felt like in my spirit, the Lord say, you got to go talk to that guy. And I'm just like, man, I am not doing that. You know, like in Wendy's, come on, Lord. You know, don't you have more class than that? You know, I'm thinking of all the excuses I can come up with. I'm like, I just got to do it. You know, I just feel like I got to go talk to this guy. So I go over and I say, hey, my name's Adam. What's your name? 
started talking to this guy, and he just started telling me his story, that he used to be like this attorney, and then he got into drugs, and then he lost his job and his family, he'd been living out of his car, and I just said, hey, you know what, I, I can't imagine what you're going through, but I do know this, and I just started sharing the gospel with him, and next thing I know, this guy started coming to church with me, took him to a Billy Graham crusade up, at, up in uh, North Carolina a couple of months later. Uh, I don't know if this guy truly got saved, but you just never know what's gonna happen when you're just being obedient to do what God's called you to do. It's not easy. I certainly have missed a hundred more opportunities that I've maybe tried to really uh, focus on. My point is just to say we've all gotta always be ready. To, to, to do what God's calling us to do. And I don't think that we just have to sit around and say, is that God? If it's a person and you're there and you're thinking about sharing the gospel, just assume that's the Lord speaking to you, saying, hey, be a bold witness for Christ. And God often accomplishes his sovereign work in saving people through imperfect human instruments. Let's look at the end of verse 27. We just see, again, Philip's simple obedience, but we also see the curiosity of the Ethiopian. The curiosity of the Ethiopian. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. Verse 28, and as he was returning, seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, Ethiopia in that day was a large African kingdom located south of Egypt. To the Greeks and the Romans, again, it represented the outer limits of the known world. And throughout history, the kings of Ethiopia were believed to be divine gods of the sun. And for this reason, the everyday responsibility of managing and running the government of their country was thought to be beneath their divine status. Guys are always trying to find a way to get out of work, aren't they? And so all of that responsibility would often fall on the queen mother, and the queen mother carried a title named Candace. So Candace was not the name of the queen, but a title like that of Caesar or of Pharaoh. This Ethiopian was a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, and he was in charge of all of her treasure, the Bible tells us. This was like being the CFO of Ethiopia, or better yet, the Minister of Finance or the Secretary of the Treasury. An incredible position of power and authority that this Ethiopian held. And so in addition to this position of such power and prestige, it is also thought that the Ethiopian, since the scripture mentions that he is a eunuch, also provided oversight to the king's harem. Being a eunuch means that he was castrated and therefore, he lacked the testicles or the hormones in order to reproduce or be involved in any sexual act. And because of this, eunuchs were the perfect candidates to be in charge of the king's harem. And even with this complex and varied background, this man knew that he was missing something. He had an empty void in his life. He was searching for something more. And the fact that he was seeking after truth is shown by his incredibly long journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. But it looks like he's now leaving Jerusalem, heading back to Ethiopia empty-handed. He still hasn't found what he's looking for. Why? Well, Judaism was broken. Jerusalem was full of money changers, sexual exploitations, and man-made power. And at this particular point in history, Judaism was completely spiritually bankrupt. This is precisely why Jesus cleared the temple in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 13, where we read, and Jesus entered the temple and he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it into a den of robbers. Remember, Jesus had confronted the spiritual leaders of Jerusalem in Matthew 23, 13 through 15, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make, a simple, to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much of a child of hell 
as you yourselves. Now, that's the spiritual lay of the land. So when the Ethiopian eunuch came to find God, to find faith, he saw a bankrupt system. Jerusalem was a sewer of dead religion. Kind of reminds us in church history a little bit of Martin Luther and his story of how he first visited Rome. He too was looking for something to satisfy his soul, but his expectations were overthrown by his disappointments. Rome was a city where every aspect of the divine was to sell for profit. Luther said, quote, if there is a hell, then Rome is built over it. Luther called Rome a cesspit of sin. This first visit of Luther to Rome left him disgusted, and therefore he searched more than ever for the God of the Bible, and Luther found the God of the Bible, not in Rome, but in his Bible. In Romans 1.17, the conversion verse that God used to bring light into Luther's eyes, which says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And finally, Luther realized that salvation was offered freely by a merciful God, and the just would live by faith and not by works. And I can't help but think that the Ethiopian eunuch may have had a similar experience in Jerusalem. And now he must find God on his own through the scriptures. And while the Ethiopian eunuch was in Jerusalem, he would have been denied any entrance into the temple. Number one, he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. But number two, he was a eunuch. You see, Deuteronomy Chapter 23, verse 1, made it clear that no man like this could enter the temple. That verse says, no one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Further, he also would have not been allowed to become a full proselyte. He would have been limited to the status of a God-fearer who would have attended the synagogues and read the scriptures, but been stopped short of any temple practice. But not all was lost. God's sovereignty in salvation supersedes and it overcomes all laws, all customs, and all cultures. And while in one sense there is no one who seeks after God, in another sense, God draws those that he has chosen to himself. And when God draws a sinner, he puts in that sinner a desire to search and to seek and to learn more about the living God. Such is the case with this eunuch. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. In John 6, 37, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. It is amazing to read about how the eunuch was seated in his chariot reading the prophet Isaiah. While he may have left Jerusalem without saving faith, at least he had a copy of God's word in his hands. And he may have purchased this scroll while in Jerusalem, and it would have been rather unusual for an individual to possess his own copy of the scripture. It would have been rather expensive, and it was not a common practice. And so we see there's definitely something going on as the spirit is at work in the Ethiopian's growing curiosity. It reminds us that there is room at the cross for this eunuch, and there is room at the cross this morning for you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you think your identity is, you can have a new life and a new attitude and a new identity. Jesus can radically transform your life. All you have to do is to come. All you have to do is to turn from all of your wicked ways and, and to realize that you'll never be satisfied with anything that this world can ever offer all you have to do is to abandon your broken religion of self-worship and worship the living God who made you and who has called you to walk in spirit and in truth. And so what we're seeing, again, in this passage this morning is that Philip had that divine encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch, and when given the opportunity, Philip made our second heading here. He made a clear declaration. He did not miss this opportunity. He has a command, your next blank, the command to go. 
the command to know, we, to go. We already know in verse 27, it says that he rose and went. And then here in verse 29, it says, and the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And so when Philip arrived there on the road to Gaza, he probably saw not too far away, this Ethiopian there in the chariot. And no doubt a dignitary like this would have traveled with an entourage meaning there may have been more than just a chariot. There could have been several servants accommodating him. There may have been additional camels and even a whole caravan involved in his, uh, in his trip. And the Spirit says to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And again, I love how instantly Philip obeyed, although it could have felt a little intimidating. Philip could have wondered what it was that he would say when he got over there. Philip was being bold. He, he's being obedient, and he's walking by faith. And that's what we see earlier in the book of Acts when Peter and John had been arrested for preaching the gospel. They said in Acts chapter 4, why don't you just look back with me, just a couple of chapters to your left. Acts chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, it says, But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So they can't help it, right? They've got to make the declaration. And when Peter and John shared what happened to them, they were arrested. And then we read in Acts 4.29, they prayed like this, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Look down at verse 31 of the same chapter. And when they had prayed, the place in which they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with, with what? With boldness. That characterizes a believer. They're bold. They're bold testimonies of what Christ has done, of his perfect life and his death and his resurrection. They're not afraid. They don't run for the corners or for the darkness. They run out into the light and declare God's truth. I wonder if you have this kind of boldness. Are you ready to share the gospel with whomever you meet? Are you willing to go over and join your neighbor in a conversation to see where God might take it? It was C.T. Studd, the missionary, who said, quote, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And not only is there com the command to go here, but we also read, your next blank says, the compulsion to talk the compulsion to talk, verses 30 and 31. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Well, lo and behold, when Philip did approach the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot, he heard him reading from Isaiah. Surely, in that moment, his heart must have leapt for joy. I mean, here is an Ethiopian in the middle of the desert heading back to Africa, and yet he's reading from the Holy Scripture, and he just happens to be reading a pretty good book. They're all good books, but Isaiah is incredible. I can't help but to be reminded even of the story of Gideon in Judges 7 when God called him to defeat the Midianites. Remember, he was a little bit timid about doing that. He had whittled down his army to only 300 men. And then the Lord said to Gideon, if, he, if you're afraid, you should go to the camp of the Midianites and hear what it is that they're saying. And so Gideon went, and then we read in Judges 7, 12, where it says the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number, and as the sand that is on the seashore and in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of, the, of Midian, and, and it came to the tent and struck it down so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon. The son of Joash, a man of Israel, God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. And as soon as Gideon heard of the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped and he returned to camp, the camp of Israel and said, arise for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. I love that story. God gave Gideon this special encouragement to be bold, to walk in obedience and the Lord also blessed his efforts. And that goes a long way in evangelism. 
if Philip was afraid at all, or if he did feel intimidated, surely after he heard the Ethiopian reading from Isaiah, all fear was gone. Philip strategically asked, do you understand what you're reading? Great question. I found that asking good questions is often the best way to get into a real, authentic, evangelistic conversation. And the Ethiopian said, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. And this is where, again, I'm reminded that we can't just live out our faith. We need to talk about our faith. Love the people who say, just be Jesus how you live. And I just want to add, you know, comma, and speak to them about the Jesus that you live for. You know, so it's both. I understand that. There's times that you don't have the opportunity to speak and you just live it out. But this is a reminder. Philip just couldn't live out his faith in front of the Ethiopian and him become a Christian, right? He needed to talk to him. He needed to engage. We can't just be good examples. God's called us to be faithful evangelists. And we can't just affirm faith claims. We must address the heart from God's word. In other words, you can't just say, are you a Christian? And they say, yes. Do you believe in God? And they say, yes. Do you go to church? And they say, yes. And you're like, oh, great, me too. You know, you, you haven't even scratched the surface yet of what it truly means to be a believer. And God can sovereignly save anyone that he wants at any time. But most of the time, he uses people to share the good news. The good news is in the Bible. But the Bible needs to be explained correctly. Romans 10, 14 through 15, again, how would they call upon the one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe without him whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. God the Holy Spirit works through the scripture to open hearts. The scripture is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The scripture is what we want to talk about with others. And we don't necessarily want to debate all of the cultural issues of the day. We want to preach Christ from the word in order for people to be born again. And then you might have more meaningful cultural conversations. The cultural conversations can certainly get you to Christ, but until you get to Christ from the scripture and proclaim the gospel, you may never have any real agreement on those other issues. God's called us to open the word. Let the lion out of its cage, as Spurgeon said. Let him roar, let him do his work. And he's the one that's gonna save souls and change lives. And so we see the command to go, we see the compulsion to talk, and now, verses 32 through 35, we see the commitment to explain. The commitment to explain. Verse 32, now, the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In this, in his humiliation, justice was denied him who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I asked, does the prophet say this about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. He just happened to be reading Isaiah. He just happened to be reading Isaiah 53, which is definitely the Spirit's preparation. It's Isaiah 53, which is that famous chapter that describes Jesus on the cross. Like how much better could this be, right? A, a modern parallel of this event might be something like if you were to picture yourself sitting in an airport waiting for departure and a stranger was sitting next to you and just happened to be reading an open Bible in their lap, and they may not be reading aloud, but their fingers moving across the lines as they ponder the words, and you happen to glance over and notice that this person's reading John chapter three, and they're quickly approaching verse 16. And so God emboldens you to say something to that individual that you're looking at, and so you say something like, well, how unusual to find someone reading a Bible in an airport. Isn't that third chapter of John so amazing? And the stranger turns to you and replies, well, it is interesting, but I'm stumped on this 16th verse. 
What exactly does it mean to believe in Jesus and have eternal life? Now, if that was to happen to you, you think you can handle it from there? And this is kind of what's happening to Philip. I mean, he's right there. It's Isaiah 53. It's talking about Christ and the Ethiopian eunuch's like, I don't really understand. What is he talking about? The question of the Ethiopian was understandable since some of the Jews of that day thought that it was divided of what that interpretation should be, particularly verses seven and eight. Some talked about the sheep that was slaughtered represented the nation of Israel facing persecution throughout their history. Others said that the prophet Isaiah was speaking about himself. The correct view would be that Isaiah was talking about Jesus. He was talking about the Messiah. And it was Philip who was able to open his mouth and to begin from this scripture. And he told him about the good news of Jesus from that very passage. Every believer should strive to be proficient in the scriptures so that we too can meet people where they are and to lead them from wherever they are straight to Christ. In the words of Peter, 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Any effective presentation of the gospel must solidly be placed in the scripture. There is no substitute. The personal use of your testimony, stories, tracts, all can be helpful. Certainly there are tools that God uses, but make sure to take them to the word of God. Make sure to teach them what the Bible actually says. Scripture alone is the power of God for salvation, Romans 1, 16. And so in this case, Philip was helping the Ethiopian understand Isaiah 53. And this chapter is all about the prophecy of the coming Messiah as God's suffering servant. In verses 1 through 2 of Isaiah 53, it describes Jesus' birth. In verse 3 of Isaiah 53, it talks about the Messiah's life and ministry. In verses 4 through 9 of that chapter, it's about Christ's substitutionary death. And then verses 10 through 12 of Isaiah 53 is all about his victorious resurrection. No doubt Philip went through the whole chapter with him to give him context of what it was that he was asking. And those very verses again were Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before his shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth in his humiliation. Justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken away from the earth? Again, those verses describe our Lord as being the willing sacrifice for sinners, even up to the point of losing his life. As Philip explained these verses to him, the Ethiopian began to understand the gospel because the Spirit of God was opening his mind to God's truth. It's not enough for the lost sinner to desire salvation, he must also understand God's plan of salvation. It is the heart that understands the word that eventually bears fruit. Jesus said in the parable of soils in Matthew 13, 23, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, he indeed bears fruit. So we got to make sure that we don't just have the word read. It's got to be explained and it's got to be understood. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The doctrine of illumination, the doctrine of regeneration, all the Spirit's work to both save a soul, open their minds so they can clearly see and understand. And yet we're called to be the one who's explaining, who's, 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 who's there kind of walking them through what this means. Nehemiah 8.8 8 says they read from the book, from the law of God, but that's not all they did. They also gave the sense, Ezra did. He gave the sense, is one of those first verses explaining expository preaching. He gave the sense. He explained so that what the people uh, heard they could understand, basically, is what Nehemiah 8 8 says. Titus 2 15, Paul says so much that we are to declare these things, to exhort and to rebuke with all humility. Let no one disregard you. Again, when's the last time? Just asking, when's the last time you opened the Bible with someone? I mean, sometimes in today's culture, we're doing good, again, just to have a conversation with a neighbor at like a 30,000 foot level. And and I'm fine with that. That's building, you know, relationship, getting opportunity to follow up more. I'm just curious, when's the last time you actually opened a Bible with a coworker, with a classmate, with a neighbor, and sat down and had a significant conversation about the gospel? 
I pray that God would just give us more opportunities to, to open God's word and to sit down with someone and show them what the Bible actually says about eternal life and to explain it to them. And this is what Philip is doing with the Ethiopian eunuch. Let's pray that God gives us more opportunities to do the same. We've been learning about this divine encounter. We're seeing a clear declaration of the gospel. And then last, verses 36 to 40, there's a genuine conversion. A genuine conversion, your next blank says, true faith exercised. True faith here is exercised. Verse 36 through 38 says, uh, we pick up again in verse 36, and, this, uh, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. We see here, again, true faith being exercised. When someone is truly born again, their whole life is transformed. And now, Because of their new nature that God's given them, there are new desires, new convictions, and a whole new direction of life. A new Christian wants to walk in obedience to God's word. Before you were in a a Christian, you hated God's word. You hated the thought of obedience. You, You didn't want to follow God. You couldn't even follow God if you had have wanted to. For Romans 8, 6 through 8 says, for the mind set on the flesh is death but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That that whole passage is talking about our depravity. Before you come to Christ, you cannot walk in obedience. You are dead to your sin, in your sin and your trespasses. And up to this point in his life, the eunuch had not been submitting to God's law. Up to this point, the eunuch was not able to walk in obedience. Up to this point, it was impossible for the eunuch to truly please God. But now, after the explanation of Psalm of uh, Isaiah 53, after understanding the substitutionary atonement of Christ dying in his place and being raised from the dead to give newness of life, all of this would have been clearly explained by Philip. Now at this point, he understands that he's a new believer and he needs to walk in obedience because of the power of the resurrection of Christ is now brimming up in his soul. And he, is, he has saving faith that, that's been granted by God. And it's having its sanctifying effect on his life. And one of the very first acts of obedience for the new Christian is the desire to be baptized. Believer's baptism is something serious in the Bible. It's something that's taught. It's something that's commanded, and it's something that true believers do. Again, the Great Commission, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus preached us to be baptized. Peter preached baptism in Acts 2.38 at at Pentecost. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The Samaritan believers that we read about earlier here in Acts chapter 8 were also baptized. They had been baptized Acts 8, 16, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul would be baptized immediately after his conversion in Acts 9, verse 18, and Ananias came and prayed for him, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. Cornelius and those in his household were also baptized immediately after they believed in Acts 10, verse 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Philippian jailer was baptized on the same night that he believed in Acts 16, 33, and he took them that same hour of the night to wash their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. So we got to understand that from Christ to the apostles, through the spreading of the gospel throughout Acts, baptism is something that needs to be preached and emphasized to every believer, It must be clearly understood that baptism does not save you. Certainly, we never want to confuse baptism as somehow a work of salvation. There is no such thing as baptismal regeneration. You cannot be born again because you were sprinkled as a child or dunked as a young person or an adult because you went through that as a rite of passage. It's all about what's happening in your heart 
And as a true believer of Christ, in Christ, you now are becoming baptized to follow this command. It must be clearly understood that it doesn't save you because you're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, and not by any act of obedience or anything you could ever do, including baptism. And yet, at the same time, there is a very loud and clear emphasis on baptism that was clearly made by Christ and the apostles. Therefore, when Philip evangelized the eunuch, certainly there was some clear teaching on the doctrine of believers' baptism. I mean, why else would the eunuch all of a sudden say, see, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? You can make a reasonable assumption that Philip had waxed eloquently about salvation in Christ and about following and obeying those first steps as a new convert, which would be to be baptized. And I love the conviction of the new convert. He, he doesn't want to wait any longer. He doesn't want to think about it. He doesn't want to labor over his decision. He was saved. He was taught what the scripture said about baptism, and he's ready to obey. So the Ethiopian eunuch is like, stop the chariot. Let's do this right here. There's some water. What's preventing me from being baptized? I love that type of conviction. Now, I have a note in my Bible. See if you have it there in yours at the end of verse 36, which says about verse 37, which isn't found here in your English translation. Some manuscripts add all or most of verse 37. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He's answering the question about, can I be baptized? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now again, all this note is saying is that most scholars don't include this verse, verse 37, because it was not included in the earliest and most accurate manuscripts. Please understand that what is said in verse 37 is not saying anything heretical or contradictory to what the Bible teaches. It's just simply saying that this particular verse, verse 37, is not found again in the oldest, most original manuscripts that are trusted and, and done, have textual criticism done on them, which is a whole other topic. I do appreciate, however, that verse 37 is still mentioned here as a footnote. I, emphasize, I appreciate the emphasis of making sure there is an accurate understanding of the gospel and a genuine belief in the person and work of Jesus Christ, which ought to serve as a prerequisite for any baptism. Notice here in verse 36 and 38 where the word baptism is used, it's the word baptizo in the Greek, literally baptizo, which means to be immersed or to be dipped. And every Greek lexicon that you can find will define baptize as this way, to be immersed or to be dipped. Please note again, verse 38 says, and they both went down into the water. And then look at verse 39 where it says, and they both came up out of the water. So again, I'm just saying at a simple reading of the text, understanding both lexically what baptism means and seeing the, the prepositions here of down into and up out of clearly shows a believer's baptism by immersion. The Ethiopian eunuch wants to exercise his faith by being baptized. Love that about his conversion. In fact, I would go so far as to say that if the Ethiopian eunuch was not baptized, and if he just went on his way after Philip explained Isaiah 53 to him, then we might have reason to question his salvation. And the same is true for people today. If someone tells me they believe in Jesus, and they can explain Isaiah 53, and they say that they're a born-again Christian, and yet they have not been baptized, particularly as a young adult, where there's more cognitive understanding and assumption that they've been aware of baptism for some time now, and they haven't been baptized, and I began to pause and to question the validity of their own salvation. Now, again, it may be that they need to be taught, they need to be challenged, they need to be encouraged. I don't ever force anybody to be baptized. I never twist their arm behind their back. I just say what the Bible says. You need to be baptized. You need to identify yourself with Christ through baptism. Why? Because that's what Jesus said. That's what the Bible says. There's really no way around it. And when somebody tells me I'm scared or I'm afraid or I don't want to give my testimony, I just say, hey, I can understand that. That could be a very daunting feeling. 
and, and we all can be nervous of public speaking, but you know what, we'll help you. We'll help you share your testimony. I'll stand up there with you. We just want you to tell people you love Jesus, that he died in your place, that you've repented and believed in him, and then we want you to obey Jesus by being baptized. I just think that too many times, baptism is like a second thought or a third thought or something that happens years later after conversion, and that's just not the practice that we see in the Bible. Now, I understand, again, if you're a parent, you've got Christian young kids. I have five kids. We wrestled through each one, when to baptize them, when they were ready, and there may be a conversion that happens at age four, five, six, seven, eight. Hard to tell sometimes, and they may not get baptized until they're more like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I understand that there's a transition, but I'm also just saying that if you're here in this sermon, and you're you're just appreciating the Ethiopian getting baptized and you're just kind of like, yeah, <laughs> he got off his chariot and he got baptized, good for him. What about you? That's my question to you. What about you? You're here this morning. You're 13 years old. You're a young man. You're a young woman. You can define the gospel. You can articulate the gospel. You're here. You're at the master's university. You're, you're maybe older in our youth group. You're 17, 18 years old and you've been a Christian for five years and you've never been baptized, let me just encourage you, today's the day to make that decision in your heart to say, you know what, I need to follow the Lord in obedience. And we're gonna have a baptism class here in just another month or two. We're gonna start a new members class here uh, later this month, or in February rather, and then there'll be a baptism class to follow that, and we can talk more about it. But you just gotta appreciate again, as I've read to you this morning, through the book of Acts, every new convert gets baptized. So true faith is exercised, and then B in your outline, true faith is expressed. It's expressed, verse 39, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Well, now that the eunuch has completed his act of obedience, it's time for Philip to move on to his next assignment, just like God brought Philip there in a whirlwind. He takes him away in a whirlwind. And God will provide someone else to disciple and help this eunuch grow in his faith. The eunuch has been evangelized. He has been obedient. And now he must continue to grow in his own study of Scripture for his growth and development. And the Spirit of the Lord wanted to relocate Philip to a new location. The Ethiopian eunuch seems to understand that Philip came suddenly by an act of God and left suddenly by an act of God. He doesn't seem to be frightened or upset. He simply continued along his journey rejoicing in the work of God and the work in his heart. And one possible consideration of the joy that the Ethiopian is experiencing is the fact that, he would, that even though he would never be able to have children physically because he's a eunuch, he may have come into a deeper understanding of what else Isaiah says. Do you know what else Isaiah says to eunuchs? Turn with me to Isaiah 56. You've got to see this if you haven't read Isaiah 56 in a while. So I'm just saying, what else is the eunuch rejoicing in? He might be rejoicing in this very truth. While he can't have physical children, he can still have an incredible spiritual legacy. All is not lost. Now that he is a Christian, he can focus on living for Christ and having an eternal impact just three chapters from Isaiah 53 is Isaiah chapter 56, verses 4 and 5, where God's word says something to eunuchs. Verse 4, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Is it possible that the eunuch in his study of Isaiah 53 continued reading and as he got to chapter 56, he might have been thinking like, oh man, I shouldn't have, you know, gone through the eunuch thing. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. You know, I was, I was not saved. Maybe he was forced. Maybe he was a slave. Maybe he thought it was a position to advance his cause. Who knows? But maybe he thought, oh man, I really wish that hadn't have happened. You know what? God's got something for that eunuch and for anybody that that's happened to. He said, look, if you come to me now and you walk with me now and you walk in obedience to my word and you hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls. So we say, hey, you're coming to heaven because you're in Christ and I'm gonna give you a monument and I'm gonna give you a name 
And that name is better than you having sons and daughters. Better than having a physical lineage, you can have the opportunity to have an everlasting name that will never be cut off. And you gotta think as a Christian, this eunuch will receive again that inheritance, which is better than anything else this world has to offer, including family. What an amazing encouragement. I don't know if he read that or not, but we know sooner or later he might have if he was there in Isaiah 53. But we do know that he left rejoicing. Joy is a mark of a true Christian. That's what Christians do. They rejoice. They're filled with joy. And there's many verses that I listed there. I'll just read one of them to you. John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Well, I wonder if you're experiencing the joy of the Lord today. Joy comes from Jesus. Joy comes from obedience. Joy comes from meditating on God's word. And so we see here now in this conversion, true faith has been exercised through baptism. True faith has been expressed through the joy that's in the eunuch's heart. And then last, true faith extends. True faith extends, verse 40. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Azotus is about 20 miles north of Gaza. It was the current name for that ancient Philistine city that I mentioned earlier, Ashdod. I love how Philip went there and through all the towns, verse 40 talks about of that coastal region. He's still preaching the gospel. Wherever Philip was, he was doing the Lord's work, extending the kingdom. Philip ended up, according to verse 40, in Caesarea, a little bit further north there on the same coast, where he apparently settled down and ministered for the next 20 years. Next time we read about Philip is in Acts 21, verse 9. It tells us about him and his four daughters who were also involved in a prophetic ministry. Now, Luke does not give us the final history of the Ethiopian eunuch, but according to church father Irenaeus, he became a missionary as we would expect, to the Ethiopians. Now, I love to hear how missionaries got their call to go to the world and to tell others about Jesus. Their before and after story. We see a little bit of a before and after of this eunuch. One of my, befav- my, my favorite before and after stories of missionaries would be the Englishman that I quoted earlier by the name of C.T. Studd, who lived in England from 1860, and he died in 1931. C.T. Studd was born into privilege and wealth, but God had other plans for his life. His father was converted after hearing the famous American evangelist D.L. Moody, which we mentioned earlier as well. Then shortly after, C.T. and his brothers were also born again. Six years after C.T.'s conversion, he realized that his commitment to the Lord Jesus was lacking, and so he decided to give everything up. He was rich. He was a professional cricket player. He was well-known. And as C.T. Studd contemplated the mission field, he wisely said, I know that cricket would not last and honor would not last and nothing in this world would last, but it was worthwhile living for the world to come. C.T. spent the rest of his life sharing the gospel with people in China, India, and Africa. And on one furlough, While C.T. was back home in England, he was asked why he was going back into the dangerous mission field to which he replied this famous quote, some want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. The gospel message is the sound that we should want to hear more than the sound of church bells because it's the gospel that transforms and saves lives. And in response to what Jesus has done, may we be motivated to live for him, to be obedient to whatever call he has placed on your life and to serve here at our local church and to serve other ministries and organizations and to be willing to go to the ends of the earth to lift high the name of Jesus. You know, just one encounter can change your life. Have you had that encounter? Are you willing to be the catalyst to be that encounter for someone else? May God give us the boldness to share Christ with others even this week. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ after we close here in just a moment with our last song, I've made several appeals throughout the sermon that you would come to Christ today, 
no matter who you are, no matter what your background, you may feel like you have a, a wretched past and there's no way you could ever be brought into the kingdom of God. And yet, if that can happen for the eunuch, it can happen for you. And so this morning, please don't leave before you would come at the end of our last song. We'll have a few people by this back door. We would love to talk to you about how you could come to know this same Jesus from Isaiah 53. If you're here this morning, you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to think and pray about following the Lord in obedience on that command. And if you're here and you have anything going on in your life this morning that we could pray for you about, we're ready and available to minister to you after this last song. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the encouragement. After last week, seeing Simon the sorcerer just kind of go in the wrong direction and that Peter uh, said to him, may your silver uh, perish with you in hell. And yet today we see the Ethiopian eunuch. We, we know you can't win them all. Uh, you can, Lord, but we, we sometimes just witness something like the sorcerer and sometimes we witness something like the eunuch. And I just pray we'd be encouraged as we leave today that there may be people that we would think would never come to Christ and yet they're having spiritual questions, maybe reading even portions of scripture, that we may get close enough to them to hear what their questions may be and that we would have the boldness to ask questions, to engage in conversation, that you would allow us to have beautiful conversations about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, if there be someone here today who's never been born again, maybe they're still there on the chariot wondering what eternity is all about, I pray that you would draw that young man, that young woman, that person to yourself this day and open their eyes through your word to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we wanna walk in love we want to walk in obedience and we want to live a life of rejoicing as we continue our path, the mission that you've called us to, that we would seek to have encounters with others about the glory of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's respond to God's word one more time this morning by standing and lifting up our voices together to worship our Lord. Indeed, he is exalted.
God, we praise you to this morning. We thank you for your word, for your servant Adam preaching it faithfully. We thank you that we could lift our voices in freedom and sing your praises for indeed you are exalted and on high. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for today. Amen. <laughs>